Hey everybody, Edo here, and I am excited because I have not one guest, but two guests. I have Manny at, on top or in the middle, depending on the video, and <laughs> Nate, say hello guys. How's it going? Hey. It's going well, and they are from Mind Bottling Games, famous for Dice Throne. You guys had right. an incredible Kickstarter, and is Dice Throne to backers yet, or soon to be, or where are we at in the in So the we are currently, we've, we've uh, contacted all our fulfillment companies and we've talked to the factory and they are supposed to be putting the product on the boat here hopefully this week awesome awesome so in process for yep. getting to fulfillment and then from fulfillment going out to all the backers yep, that's right we're and um and that was quite a a, a a kickoff campaign right um nate on design manny on the art and then collaboration there in as well mm -hmm. yep. right guys Yep. That's right. Yep. Well, so um, actually, there are a variety of topics that I'm curious about, and I just want to jump right in. To start, sure. though, think looking at Dice Throne, right? So that was um, a really successful campaign for you guys, but e in particular, and I know this answer a little bit, but for everyone else's value, um, you guys had some really fantastic growth um, as the campaign went on, and then just sort of that usual explosive spike. But it 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 was an impressive. Um, track and from talking with you guys, at least uh, Nate, unless you want to change your story, a big part of that <laughs> was Facebook ads, right? Yeah, that was definitely uh, a, a fairly large chunk of it. And so, in terms of you know when you when you think of it now, uh, how, and you you work in in video games and some mobile stuff, right? Yeah, we both work in mobile. Um, I work for Niantic, the makers of Pokemon Go, currently. And Manny? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I do self-published games. I have a a guy that I make apps for. Awesome. But and so with Niantic, had you had experience doing Facebook ads, or was that sort of new to you with your campaign? No, I had never run Facebook ads at all. Actually, uh, this was, in fact, I had never. Although I worked for an ad agency for a number of years, um, making games for uh, you know Disney and Pixar and stuff like that. Um, ironically, working for an ad agency, I never had to do anything with ads. Uh, so yeah. this was a crash course for me, uh, and I learned a lot rapidly. Well, so that, yeah. this, is, this is what, to start it off, you know, Facebook ads 101. What, <laughs> yeah. what should people keep in mind and sort of what was your approach? I mean, it, it's specific to your games, but what are sort of the general things you learned along the way? Yeah, <clears throat> so Facebook ads, um, I, I, boy, I did learn a lot. Uh, number one, I would say that you can start small and should. So you basically can put whatever amount you want per day, and that's the maximum. And then you set whatever keywords you want um, to go with that. And these keywords are more like in Facebook, as opposed to Google AdWords or something like that, they're more like uh, likes or dislikes even um, that people have in their profiles. So I could target, for example, everybody that liked Board Game Geek or everybody that liked Magic the Gathering or whatever. So for everybody, I would say figure out what, what kind of games people like that would also like your game. And then put all of those things on there. Or what websites would people go to that would also like your game? And so you can add all those on there. Uh, and then you can do a lot of A-B testing. And where that basically means you run two different ads. So you'll have uh, you know, one version of an ad with uh, some certain you know, graphic design, one style, and another version that has it a different style. And you put a maximum dollar amount to each of them, and you see which one performs better. And you can set the max budget for the day to, you know, like we did, I think, $50 for the first day. And we thought, let's just test the waters. And if you set up inside of Kickstarter, you can set up a unique URL so that you use that in your Facebook ads and you can exactly perfectly track everybody that clicked on the ad. Not that they just clicked on the ad and came to your Facebook but or came to your Kickstarter, but more than that, actually converted and bought something. Uh, so it's really, really perfect track um, there as well. And, and, so and a few tips. Go ahead. Go ahead. Before your tips, just to, to tease some of that out, just so everyone understands all the parts, because it's critical and hugely valuable, especially if you get it right like you guys did. But a couple of things you talked about. One, in Facebook, you're used to them always pushing and promoting, make this into an ad, do this ad. But once you've done that once, so you can always go into their ad manager. Um, I mm -hmm. think it's Facebook backslash ad, but there's a whole dashboard yep. available to you. And they have lots of walkthroughs on making your first ad and then setting up different campaigns. So there's a lot of information in there, but it's pretty good at taking you through it. So that was one thing that, that you mm -hmm. mentioned. So that ad manager yep. is a great place to go. And then the other one on Kickstarter, um, in your campaign, if you go to your dashboard on the left, 
you can then go to um, uh, the dash, it's called dashboard, right? Yeah, you click on dashboard and, and then under scroll. refers. Yeah, under the big chart that says Kickstarter referral, friend referral, and it's got the like all the different details. Then there's that uh, uh, create another tracking ID or whatever it's called, and that's where you can yeah. say like Facebook ad one, Facebook ad two, Facebook ad hero face. Um, yep. and then create those to link. And then as they get hits, they'll appear in that above list. I f correct me if I'm wrong, but if it doesn't result in a sale, does it even, can you look at it anywhere? I think it'll only appear if it actually converts. Is that correct? Well, that's true in the referrers section. However, uh, now Kickstarter fully supports Google analytics. So if you connect up Google Analytics, then you can track everybody that's visiting your Kickstarter, how long they're on your Kickstarter, where they came from, everything you want to know about it, um, if you connect Google Analytics. Uh, but in the referrer section, which is much simpler, it's, it's really brain dead simple, um, that only tracks conversions and where they came from. And the last thing I'll add, and then I want to go into your tips, is just the, the reason you want to know whether it converts is you're pumping this ad, these ads into a channel but you want to make sure that the money you're spending there is turning into actual backers backing your product so right. that you can say, well, we spent $50 over here. We only sold one copy. Well, that cost, you know, that means we only made 30 bucks on the 50 we spent. But if you said 50 over here and you turned over 500 as an example, right. well, that would be mm -hmm. really meaningful. But keep going. I just wanted to make sure everyone was following along there since I don't have any cool graphics as you are going through this. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's all right. Um, so I will say we, in total on ads, we spent about 10 grand, uh, and we were not planning on spending that at that's all. That's a huge I, number, right? Like most people just, just, yeah. they just stopped. They were like, what? <laughs> like, that's a huge yeah. number. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. But keep going. I mean, but yeah, it was. So, so we basically, the, I mean, again, I had never run a Facebook ad in my life. And so the first day, you know, I ran it at $50 and I just watched it very, very closely. And how, how it actually works, you don't know how many impressions that's really going to be. Um, what happens is based on the keywords you pick and the countries you pick and a variety of other things, it's, it's a bidding war that happens behind the scenes. You have no idea what the actual price is. Um, but if everybody's bidding for Thrones, right, because Game of Thrones is popular or whatever, then that word is going to be much, much more expensive. Um, if you pick a word that nobody cares about, uh, like then that'll be much cheaper. So, and that's true for countries as well. So we basically ran, um, you know, a few different, or I ran a few different things where if they like these, if they like these, and then how much is it costing me in this ad set for conversions and th versus this ad set for conversions. And so we tried overall, we tried four different ads throughout the campaign and very quickly realized where we were not getting enough conversions, which countries, which locations, which words, um, and which uh, art even um, helped a lot. And so some tips that I learned along the way. Number one is you need to do this uh, sample, like scatter the seeds approach first with cheap dollar amounts and see what happens. And then after that, depending on what you can afford, uh, for us, we did about $50 a day for the first four days. And that was enough for me to figure out which ads were really performing well. And then we picked our one ad and dumped all of the marketing money into that which I went from 50 to $100 a day, and it was still returning about a 4X return. Um, so then I upped it to 200, and then I upped it to 500, and by the last 48 hours, I was doing $1,500 a day um, wow. in ads. So then to talk for a second about conversions, the Dice Throne campaign was how large overall? 181,000. 181,000, and you know, you can never, you know, you have the sort of growth effect and all these other pieces, but you did have this direct attribution you said you spent about close to ten thousand dollars. How much do you think that turned into in terms of of, of your campaign? So we had, um, I can say that directly from ads, we had thirty six grand in return, and we spent a grand total of actually it was ninety two hundred in total in ads. Um, now that's just measurable conversions, right. but there's a lot of immeasurable conversions, right? Because sure. Kickstarter is all about yeah. the snowball effect. Oh well, yeah, and you're blowing big, through, people are sure. seeing it, it's popping up. They're like, why is this thing doing so well? And, and I, you know, I think it's really my, my background, or at least for a while I was working at Disney uh, interactive and, and we were doing mobile and Facebook at, at games. And so we were constantly doing that AB testing. And to some degree that scattershot approach, it's just this idea that frankly, you might have some intuition or a guess, but, just let the market tell you what's going to work because you can yeah. do all this A/B testing. Um, yep. 
but you know if you can just funnel into this stuff it can it can have a really a really big return i think that again people sort of think of doing facebook ads they throw twenty dollars at it see something and they walk away i know it does there is certainly campaigns in my opinion that may or not be as effective or conducive to to, Agreed. to facebook ads i mean i look at dice mm-hmm. in particular super cool looking really easy to understand mechanics sort of great entry into gaming type of game so i think it was yeah. a really nice sweet spot right. for that that you leveraged i think it's a other people can be successful too but you're going to have to pick some amount of money to try and then see if it's right. worth following up with right right there's yeah, an I, interesting story there we the first piece of art and this this shows a little of the the fact that we didn't know exactly what we were doing right. we were right. at the hotel at pack south and we were like hey we should what art should we use and we're like, maybe we should use a box. Maybe we, I don't know. And we're like, hey, the pyromancer looks cool. And so we, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> they, we were like, well, she's a, she's a pyromancer and it's a really bright piece of art. So let's try that. And it was kind of funny how that, that piece actually kind of became almost a spokes piece for Dice Throne on Facebook. Right. And it was relatively arbitrary, but at the same time, we wanted to put forth a fun, you know, female face, you can see her eyes, and, you know, Nate learned a whole bunch more about even that after we did that I piece. Did, yeah. Well, yeah, well, for yeah. sure. I, I, eyes and character, facial is, is a huge draw for to humans. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, so yes. I talked to some of the team at Niantic, and they, I learned, this was after we launched our first ad, as a crash course, but they gave me a few fun tips. They, they said, uh, number one, if you can use um, a person and or character from your game up close, and have uh, the character looking, you know, eye with eye contact is there. And it's kind of like, have you ever had that feeling where someone's looking at you, you feel compelled to look back, you don't even you don't see it? It gave me the same thing in a Facebook ad as you're scrolling. If someone is looking closely at you, making that eye contact, you feel the need to look back. Exactly. <laughs> oh. uh, exactly. I, I'm and actually so, looking at uh, four eyes right now, so it's a little crazy, yes, but yes, I, I get, yes, I'm yes. almost drawn into the screen. It's so intense. <laughs> <laughs> and then the other tip that they the two other tips one was um use a female they said it, you know it doesn't that's not always always the case but much more often uh both women and men are more likely to click on a female um so that's exactly what we did and then and in fact we tried this is the this is one of the ads similar that we ran this is the shadow thief on my shirt here and he looks really cool in my opinion. I thought that might do really well. And that ad way underperformed um, compared to the Pyromancer ad, which I, w- I was not expecting. Um, so there must be something to that. And then uh, the last thing is there's so much noise on Facebook. I mean, people are just scrolling rapidly right through that stuff. So you have to figure out how do I grab their attention as they're scrolling? And if you have anything that blends in with the Facebook skin and colors itself, you've lost people. So we specifically picked uh, it's bright yellow and orange and colors that are n- nothing at all similar to Facebook so that it would pop and get their attention. So let me, uh, I mean, I think those are all great recommendations and certainly the eyeball thing is always a big deal. Um, little secret from Disney um, and some other companies afterwards and before is you can actually do all that before your campaign and your game, right? So you're starting to think about your characters, yeah. you're starting to think about some key art, mm-hmm. your box art. You can start sampling. Like we when, when we were thinking about uh, in the social group, when we were thinking about a theme for a game, we would like or an art style. We would just do ads for an, a make believe game just to see if people click through the ad to play the game, even though like it was a blank page or just like a tracking page. And so oh. it was just basically saying what what grabs people, what is resonating with them, what's 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 pulling them in. So you can really see because you can't do that for Kickstarter. You can't do that on the Kickstarter page to see what banner grabs people when they're searching through the Kickstarter right. page. But you can sort of use Facebook as a proxy or websites or other things right. to start seeing what performs. Again, even if it's just watching your own posts or watching Instagram, it's not as official as the Facebook thing. But you can right. use that sort of earlier on to drive you in. So it is pretty useful. Um, so that, yeah, that was... Yeah. And and I, I at least on, on on Kickstarter having that momentum and the goal after goal after goal and all that stuff you guys are doing mm-hmm. um, is is pretty right. big. Let me switch to Manny for a moment because sure. that was awesome. We're going to switch gears. So 
right. Manny, you, you have a background in games, but you've also you, this is not your the, your first Kickstarter, right? You you have no. a litany. How, if you count your personal Kickstarters, what is this one? Right, I think this is eight or nine. Right, um, and one of them failed. One of your previous ones. Yeah, one of the pre- previous uh, comic book ones failed. And so, and that's what. I, and so, your previous ones were all comic books. Oh, yes. Oh, it went off. Oops, oh, sorry. No. It's fine. Oh. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> um, when, you, when you think of... So what I'm curious about is mm-hmm. very few people doing board game Kickstarters today actually have done Kickstarters in other categories. I mean, some people have, but most have. Right. Most are sort of doing it with Kickstarters. You know, can you just talk about what, it's, what doing a Kickstarter for comic books like mm-hmm. and how they're different and whether anything was transferable sure. or not or... Yeah, there's the the comic book community is very different than the board game community. And it's probably most notable if I were to take a step outside Kickstarter. If you go to like a comic convention versus a gaming convention, gamers seem to be incredibly social. They want to know. They're there to find games. They're there to meet people. They're there to to play and to experience things. Comic people, this is a generalization, but they tend to be there to find a book that they want to read. Sure. And so there's a there's a relatively introverted nature to a comic going individual, right. um, and that's of course an overgeneralization. Sure. But but one activity is playing games together, and the other one's reading. Correct. And so what I notice between the two is that gamers tend to be really uh, they want to be involved, and especially on Kickstarter, they're very very involved. They want to offer their feelings, their opinions. They want to see your face. They want to hear your voice. They want you to talk to them. Um, and the, the a lot more, they comment more, they interact more. Um, and so, but one of the universal truths, no matter what Kickstarter you're doing is your ability as the creator to engage with your fans and the backers. That is a constant. You need to be in there. You need to talk to them. You need to hear, listen, gain, take information from people and then implement it. When the people feel listened to on Kickstarter, they feel it's almost like you gain loyalty from hearing people and just be taking the time to listen, implement feedback potentially. Um, and it's, it is, uh, I don't care what Kickstarter you're running. Uh, you need to walk, go into it with this idea that these are the people making this happen. You know, we had 3,600 backers or whatever it was. Our game doesn't happen without those people. And so when, when we go into it, Treating them special, treating them with sure, importance sure. is is super valuable. And I, I went through eight comic book Kickstarters, and that was one of the things I worked really hard on, is replying immediately, um, answering questions, um, commenting, socializing sure. people. So that, that those that's probably the biggest thing. It doesn't matter what campaign you're running. Right, right. And so, and I mean, do you see any bleed between your audiences or are they really i mean were there a number of because you sort of had a little base to start with they're not so much i i i mean i would say that there there are definitely people who followed me and my work but i don't think that that was the reason why we were as successful with dice throne as we were um the i think you know if i were to guess i would say you know 100 people 150 sure. people came over you know, maybe maybe a few hundred, but honestly, that's partly because of Facebook as well. Sure. My my Facebook following is probably a little bit more vocal than the Kickstarter. You're saying five percent, some ten, you know, something. Yeah, really low. yeah. But also, each one of my comic books were very uniquely different from each other, and so even within comic books, I was going after different fan bases each time, and so I wasn't necessarily you know Spider Man issue one, then two, then three, then four, up to nine. You know, I wasn't building one fan base. I was kind of dabbling in building. Got it. And so then the, the next question I had for you guys is in terms of working together, I, if I'm, again, I, you know, because I, I, we, we had this awesome dinner at, mm-hmm. uh, at Gen Con. <laughs> Thank you very much. They, uh, uh, I, one of the, I reviewed Dice Throne, and they took me out to dinner much later, and I appreciate <laughs> it, um, at, at Gen Con. Um, but I, I didn't know you were going to do that at the time. It was just a review. Um, but in terms of the creative process, if I recall, um, you were doing the comic book stuff and then Nate, you had the design and did, was, did the character work and the art sort of follow the design or how, how, 
how did that sort of process work? Because you have such a, you have that whole comic book. Was it narrative driven or mechanic driven? How did it all come together? So I will say that um, I feel grateful that Manny and I, I feel like we're, we both have, uh, we're very strong, talented, and are completely separate areas. And that has served us very, very well. Mm -hmm. um, yep. So I've never, ever doubted or questioned Manny's art at all. Like, he's brilliant at what he does. And so I came up with the, the game design. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, you know, he came over and he played the game. And he, uh, I, I mean, maybe he could share the process. But as far as I, my understanding is, I made a barbarian character. And my understanding is he made one piece of art, one take, and I saw it and loved it. And he, we never changed it. It was in the final product. Yes. Is that the, true, the, Manny? Yes. I drew each hero one time and that was the first piece of art that was in the prototype version that you got. So that yeah. first piece of art for Barbarian, Moon Elf, Shadow Thief, etc. I did one piece. And um, so there was a very obvious art style that I wanted. Now, if we back up, we spent a year and a half, I think, prior working on an app. And I did a ton of art. And that was actually the first art that Nate threw into his template for the very, very first uh, boards right. that we printed. You said a year and a half. No, no, no. We spent like two weeks <laughs> working yeah. no, on no, it. No, no, no. No, no, no. The Dice Forge. We spent yeah. like two years working on Dice Forge. Year and a half or whatever. He's like, you didn't know it, man, but I've been working on that game forever. <laughs> I, I have all these re revealing moments with you guys. I'm sorry. I know. <laughs> You're like, what? That I, was two and a half years. I thought it was two weeks. I have, I have art from 2015. Uh -huh. That He's like, was I've Dice got the Forge. files. They're all labeled, and they're covered well, I do. in tears and I do. blood. <laughs> and nice. I do. Nice. Actually, you you can thank Facebook because it sends me memories, and it's like, hey, remember this piece you did? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, that's well, for Dice Forge, and I did it in 2015. That's fun. Yeah. Okay. So, so, and Manny, if you could slide over to the middle a little bit, mm -hmm. that light is popping. There, perfect. Um, all right. But so, no, it's cool. Um, it's so exciting. Um, uh huh. You um so. When you were thinking of those characters, it sounds like, generally speaking, you had an art style in mind, and then you saw the mechanic, and it was a barbarian or it was a pyromancer or whatever, and you mm -hmm. just you drew it, and you know, artists, a bunch of artists, other artists are going to cry when it's just like, oh, first tell, oh, blah. but yes. do you ever think of turning them? I mean, is there any narrative side to that stuff, or is it sort of, nah, it's my oh, comic yeah. book stuff? And oh yeah, there's an entire world and narrative that I have created for Dice Throne. And uh, like on the box, there's the Mad King. He's the guy sitting in the middle of the box. Right. And there's an entire mythology and all the characters are involved in it. And Oh, like good. Product place. And yeah, product place though, as far as the first version of the box, he doesn't make an appearance at, at, at all. Or he, He's just on the box, right? He's just on the box. Yep. And so he, uh, he, have, he plays a big part in the narrative world. Now, you know, if we never ever told the narrative, it wouldn't matter. But I have an entire like comic series in my mind, and, oh. like a narrative art. Yeah, very cool. Though so I will say though that none of the well, that's not true to say none of it. But there was like two sentences of narrative on our Kickstarter, um, so we haven't revealed really any of the narrative yet. But there will be a, a freely downloadable digital comic book, or you can you know buy a, a hard copy. Um, but that's actually already in the rule book. Um, in fact, it's comic.dicethrone.com, and right now it's just landing page. It says coming soon. Um, what's going but, on, so Manny? We'll, Come on, Manny. Cause, it's, cause not I'm not done yet. it's not Nate. It's not Nate. It's you. What's going on, man? <laughs> I'm just not done yet. <laughs> cool. Well, so and that, that actually led me to the, the, the third thing I wanted to talk to you guys about. And you sort of talked a little bit about this, Nate, in terms of your skills and what you're good at and, and what Manny's good at. But, you know, um, I interview a lot of creators – and they're oftentimes, um, you know, they're all different ensembles of teams and people working on. But usually they're sort of, you guys seem pretty, pretty hand-in-hand -hand partners is my impression and from talking. And so, you know, in terms of that partnership and people who are working with their friends or people they've worked in there or colleagues, like, I can't, I can't record you guys separately and not tell the other the answer. But, <laughs> you know, what, what do you think are some of the key things that have helped you guys be successful in, in, in growing and in building together, but also not, you know, 
imploding at the same time. Like, what are what are some of the things that that help? All right, I'm that? sharing first. I'm sharing first. <laughs> all right, all right, all right, all right. So, honestly, the the biggest thing is that Nate and I have a high high level of respect for each other and what we yeah. do. I know that when it comes to game balance and game mechanics, that Nate has a mind for it and a perspective on it that I do not have, and I know that. And I'm I embrace it, and I'm excited by the fact. Oops, my light keeps dimming. Um, and I and I embrace it. And the flip is also true. Nate looks at the art, the design, and the aesthetic, and says, "Manny has this. He's going to do it. It's done." Um, and then when it comes to game balance, we both bring broken things to the table. Like I bring broken heroes. Like I'll go off and I'll literally vomit up a hero and be like, "Yeah, all right, I made a hero. Let's." I, here you go, Nate. It's broken. Fix it. And yeah. he's like, yeah, sweet. <laughs> <laughs> so when it comes to game balance and play testing, we were basically a 50-50 on all of that. Yeah. So Yeah, I, w- I would... Sorry, were you still going? Go, go. I would totally agree with all of that. I, I think uh, it also helps that... I mean, Manny and I have just had a friendship for, I don't know, a decade or so now. And um, that is, that is also very much helped. And we both can, uh, we can fight no problem and, and walk away with still great friends, right? We don't hold on to anything, whatever. And, and sometimes we actually will purposely start a fight because I think the product benefits from it. Mm-hmm. And so even if we agree, sometimes I'll say, all right, Manny, you're devil's advocate on this or vice versa. Right. And we'll, we'll staunchly take the other point of view. Why shouldn't we do this? And we'll, we'll just clash on purpose um, to see, you know, what, what the end product is. Or we'll clash yeah. at dinner. Yeah, well, he, what, 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 <laughs> we'll clash at dinner. That was great. I, I wasn't even going to bring that up. But no. the funny thing is he, he's perfected it so that when you were giving your wonderful answer, your camera completely froze. Oh, um, is my camera frozen? You, you, all the audio came through. Could you just try hitting, like, video, no video quickly? See if it comes yeah, back. Yeah, sure. Da, 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 da. Hey, he's back. I don't know. Oh, Sorry about that. And then, wait, <laughs> Manny, you're not. You're not oh, no, you're moving. Manny, you're moving. Huh? Yeah, you're yes. right. yeah, bah, bah, bah. I don't know what that's going to do in the recording, but it seems fixed, and we're just going to pretend it is, and hopefully, uh, I, I okay, heard great, it goes through. So. I can't check while we're doing this. So, um, <laughs> and so, and in terms of again, to the extent you guys are comfortable talking, and we don't need to go into any specifics, but when you decided to do this together, you know, for people again who are saying, "Hey, I, I want to," uh, me and my friend want to do this. We're cool. How? much paperwork did you do up front like how much were you like this is the understanding i mean i'm sure nate had it written you know he's like but like you know how much did you sort of trust each other versus like no we had an idea and we just sort of set it all down and made a contract and then moved forward so i I actually uh would strongly recommend that even working with friends spouse best friend anything i think a contract is actually uh very very important it can protect friendships even if uh, there's a complete level of trust, it still makes expectations very clear and that protects the friendships. Um, yep. So I would actually highly recommend that. Um, for us, we we actually, so of course we opened, we have an LLC, Mind Bottling Games. Um, and in all LLCs, you literally set the percentage of ownership. And so we, it was a 50-50, um, you know, like contractually in our, our company, it's a 50-50. And so we probably, you know, honestly, we probably should have taken that even further um, and drawn up an actual contract. We didn't. We felt like, well, it's 50-50. There was at least enough trust that I know Manny's a hard worker. We, I really, res- we respect each other from how much we're going to put into this. And there was, oh my gosh, there is no shortage of late, 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 late nights um, yeah. of us working together. So I think for our, we just knew each other well enough to know there's never going to be a time where I feel like Manny's not pulling his weight and vice versa, Right. Um, so we just left it at the com- the fifty fifty level. So mm-hmm. despite your recommendation, I'm just you guys basically yeah. just sort of did. We we're going to start the company together and not worry about that. Um, we we did. That's exactly true. But I, I've seen I've seen it go really south um, for some other people who had trusted friendships. Um, <laughs> so it's not what I would say, actually. Sorry. My boy he, just decided to come out and say hi. Yeah, and actually hi. probably gets clipped because it's three people. He probably got clipped out, so they just saw. The wave and they just saw me go like, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, basically. All right, good night, buddy. Um, I'm going to bed yet. My mom's letting me stay up a little bit later. Okay. And yes. 
Hit that mute button, man. <laughs> it's fine, man. It's fine. Kids, kids are All wonderful right. things. Yeah. Good night, bud. Uh, his, his kid came in. All right. That's my wife looking at with that. Anyway. We all, all right. Hey, Perfect. If, if there you we go. know it, if you're in the hobby business, doing a hobby, you're working from home at your yep. dining table or in your attic or wherever you guys are. Um, yep. But so, um, right. I, I have to agree. I actually did a little, I don't like to like hand out contracts to people, but I did a video on sort of contracts in general. And that yep. sort of setting expectation and understanding is um, a really big part of, of yep. it, right? Um, all right. What well, I had a couple other questions. Uh, Wait, one last note. I'll oh, say on a partnership before sure. you move on. Uh, I, I will say I I really really like working with a partner a lot as long as you get the right one. And it was interesting. Mm -hmm. Just this morning, uh, Stegmeyer um, posted something about procrastination. It was a good blog article. Sure. And one of the, the notes he said was uh, in Scythe two or future expansions, he's intentionally brought in a co-designer, even though he made Scythe solo. Uh, because it helps him to stay motivated and it helps him yeah. to move forward and it helps him to, Hey, hey we're going to meet every Monday or whatever. Uh, you've got to have something done, <laughs> you know, when you meet. Uh, so having that, I think having Manny is we produced the time frame on this was ridiculously fast and that would not have happened if either of us were, were solo. Right. Right. Yeah. No, work, uh, working with people is great. I mean, that's, that's, um, and, and just having the right level of trust and understanding together is a, is a big deal. Um, you know, it's funny. I saw his procrastination post as well, and I was like, eh, I'm not going to read this. Um, <laughs> but, good show, uh, good show. Yeah, yeah you know, I, I, I was there at one point. Um, yeah. So, okay, so it's a couple other questions uh, as we're co coming to the, the time here. So one question was Gen Con. You were at Gen Con. You had the opportunity to work out of the Roxley booth. Was that your first Gen Con, or had either of you been to that convention before? Yeah, that was our no. first Gen Con. Uh, yeah. Neither of us have been. In fact, I mean, really, it's kind of funny. We Both our background is digital. And so not only we had a crash course in, in Facebook ads and everything else, but we've had a, a crash course in working in this industry. Um, you know, we've been consumers of this industry, but I've never been to a, a board game con ever in my life. Right. Uh, prior to, we applied for the, the PAX South Indie Showcase. We got in and that was the first that's right, that's right, board game related con I had ever been yep. to. Yep. And that and that one's really, that one's mostly a video game con, right? They have that yeah, area is. where you guys are sitting. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And then they have a huge library, but otherwise it, the, there's big screen TVs. I mean, the thing yeah. that'll get you at a yeah. board game con still is that like, there's almost no TVs, right? Like, right. there's no right. blaring noise, and, and even a comic convention will still have, like, guys selling the t-shirts that strobe with music, and you're just like, oh, yeah. Yep. Um, yep. But, um, and so, now you guys were in a unique position, because you were sharing a booth, and you're sharing a booth, we're well, not sharing my, you were using a portion of a booth, um, but yep. with one of the juggernauts uh, from Kickstarter and, and in the industry right now, which was Roxley, so that's not mm -hmm. going to be... Not everyone's going to have that, but um, no. <laughs> generally, though, I mean, if there was a key takeaway or two, once you got over the newness of it all, um, what as again, new creators with a Kickstarter that hadn't hasn't hadn't fulfilled yet, what were a couple of your takeaways from being at the convention? Um, you or me, Manny? Go for it. Okay, so I, I think one of the things was I we've never sold product at a convention before. Uh, and so being at PAX South, you know, we were, we had a Kickstarter running. Um, so I guess in a way we we're selling something, right. We were trying to push people to Kickstarter, but we've never sold physical product. And so I learned so much about how to hide product to put, uh, advertising above it. Uh, we got a square reader and running those transactions, learning how to do that efficiently. Um, there, there was so much I learned. And so I, I would say if you're thinking about running a Kickstarter in the future and you want to, or sell your own product in the future, volunteer at someone else's booth. Uh, contact anyone you want and say, hey, can I go there? Can I help you run your booth? Just to learn from what that's like. And just to clarify for your own safety and sake, what you're talking about learning from was selling Roxley stuff, right? Yes. You yes. weren't like right. selling copies of Dice Throne to no. people at the no. show in front of no. like, that you, Your backers are going to get it when it comes on the boat, all that stuff. Yes. So you're, Thank you, you learn for that. For, <laughs> Appreciate that. Yes. Um, but no. I mean, but yeah, I mean, I think I think that's a great a great idea, right? Hey, a everyone's always looking for help at booths. And you can get a hotel room or badge for the show, get an early. I mean, there's cool things you can do, but just mm -hmm. that free opportunity to 
trial run work in a booth is, is a big deal. Yeah. It's yeah. great for us. Any yep. takeaways for, on your end, Manny? Um, I think it, uh, I just would reiterate the, the social nature of gaming. Um, it's a breath of fresh air. I mean, I've been to 50 or 100 comic shows over the last 15 years, and I love being at a game show. With games, game conventions like this, where they're so invigorating, um, they're exhausting. And yeah. Nate loses his voice like day one. Yeah. And then, you know, the, the rest of the show is just so intense. And I, I love it. I, I think both of us really feed off how exciting it is and how invigorating it is to be interacting and showing and playing. I think, I think what yeah, you we, guys, oh, go ahead. We, we would, one of the things we would do, and we did this at both shows, and this is just a good tip in conventions in general. If, you have the stamina to do it. And thankfully, mm. Manny and I both get energized by this. But after the show ended, um, and all the shows you've been to, and we'll do this in the future as well, uh, we'd go to either if there's a, a play area in the convention or if not, in a hotel lobby or whatever. But we'd set up with people. We'd announce on our Facebook and Twitter, and people would stop by our booth, hey, we're going to be playing games. And we'd, we'd play Dice Room all night, you know, until we'd close out whatever, you know, all night long. Uh, and it was really, really fun for us. And mm. that level of connection with our fans and product and people who want our product is is so rewarding both to us and to them and so we've built many 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 what are basically mega fans um who are extremely loyal because of those kinds of steps that we've taken sure sure yep. well yeah I, I mean that kind of time with players goes a really long way and as as yep. you start having more campaigns and more mega fans um man you've probably seen this on the comic book side mm -hmm. but those repeat people Really, yeah. Bring a, it, it's a wonderful thing to have people like that, and not just on the financial side. Just like, oh, hey, I remember you. You see, yeah. I've seen all these stuff. Right. You comment on all these. It makes a big difference. The one thing I was right. going to mention to you guys is, you know, now that you know you've had the success and you've you've seen a con, I, I highly recommend you you start checking out different conventions because actually within the mm -hmm. gaming space, Gen Con's about as amped as it gets because it's the sure. biggest, craziest. But there are a lot of conventions that really lean towards designers and publishers and development talk and some mm -hmm. that are really fan centric and other ones. So there's a really nice range that, that have different levels of intensity and in like sales versus play. Um, right. And it's, it, 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 it's all there. Um, yeah. La last question for you guys. Cause we're, we're just at the mark here. Uh, I mean, you said dice thrones on the way backers are going to be getting it. What, is there a sequel, an expansion, or what are, you, what are you guys working on right now? Sure. Yeah, so Dice Throne is, is a little bit of an anomaly in the board game space. It's it's more comparable to like an LCG or something, um, where Dice Throne contains six heroes, and those heroes are all standalone. And so we plan to release many, many new heroes. So our next Kickstarter launches in January. And the current plan right now might be a little crazy in terms of Kickstarters, but we're going to basically launch... Uh, two different products in that, two different four hero boxes. And you can buy one or the other or buy them both. And one will ship in the summer and one will ship in the fall. And you can pay for shipping and get them in those times, basically two separate things. Or you can pay for shipping one time and we'll ship it all in the fall. Um, but for the people who want, so many of our fans have said, we want more heroes now, now, now. The game's not even out yet. People are already saying we want more new heroes so it's kind of like the idea is a little bit of a buy dice run in January and then the rest of the year we'll just ship it to you, you know, as it comes. Sure. And we actually want to do that every January um, and oh, add new no. heroes and a co-op mode eventually. We'd love to do an arena mode. I'd love to license uh, stuff. Uh, so, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens <laughs> with that in the future. Well, it's, I mean, it sounds, I mean, you know, you might want to add a third tier, which is just the lifelong subscription tier right that's just sort right of going big <laughs> yeah. and you'll get one as every right. time as you go so cool yeah. so and you're going to get more characters and presumably a character is the character the dice their their health track and sort of a nice yeah. little package yeah by the way i i i had the opportunity when i saw you at at, at gen con to see the and I, I would have you posted pictures of your box to your backers yet or is that is that new and coming in your updates the yeah. box, yeah, they yeah, the box. inside, the, the, mm -hmm. the yeah, inserts. with the with the vacuum trace, yeah, yeah, yeah. we have the inserts on this game uh, are super impressive, super impressive. I mean, nothing. I mean, like they they're not that crazy, but just it really is that sort of each character sort of feels like a unit thing. Yep. 
um, which I think sits so well with your idea, right? So yeah, each one of them yeah. is all, and you can pull you can pull out a solo, right? Like a one. A yeah, so they're all in their own little. Rather than one yeah. one big Super vacuum cool. tray, they each have their own little vacuum tray with their dice and their dials and their bits and yeah. all that stuff down below. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, was, I was super impressed with that. Uh, just in terms of getting to that, I want that character. Let's go, sort of feel yeah. right. I, it's super important. I think it, it's um it confuses people sometimes when we talk about it because we're talking about Dice Throne two or a sequel or an expansion, and it's a cross compatible but completely standalone and that's kind of the our mission moving forward is each game can be played by itself or you can take those heroes and i honestly i was selling people on this idea that once i got 10 or 20 heroes i'm going to put my six favorite in a box and those right. are going to be the ones i take the game <laughs> nights. and i'm super excited honestly about that that yeah. sounds so that sounds so cool it's very cool well, listen, guys, this thing's just not even going to record if I don't cut it soon. So thank you Sounds good. for being on. <laughs> and, yes, thank uh, thanks you. And thanks, everyone, for uh, watching. Bye. All right. Thanks so much, Adam. See you guys. Bye. Bye.